Good evening, and welcome to the Republican debate for the 18th Congressional Primary. I'm Andrew Muse. I'm the executive editor of the State Journal Register, and we are pleased to host this debate in conjunction with Midwest Family Broadcasting, 970 News Talk WMAY. We'd like to thank the three candidates for participating tonight. In advance of the debate, we ask the audience that you please silence any cell phones or other electronic devices you may have. We also ask that you hold your applause, cheering, or any comments until the end of the debate. Thank you. Our, con our candidates tonight are Don Rinks. He is from, was raised on a farm in Dana, Illinois, and currently resides in Benson. He currently works in the insurance industry and is a former correctional officer. In the middle, we have Mike Flynn, who was born and raised in Quincy, Illinois. He is currently an editor with Breitbart News Network and has previously worked with the Illinois House Republican Policy Committee and the American Legislative Exchange Council, among other jobs. And finally, at the, my far left, we have Darren LaHood. He is born and raised in Peoria. In 2011, he was elected to the 37th State Senate District and re-elected for a full term in 2012. He has previously been a state and federal prosecutor and currently practices law in Peoria. Our panelists tonight are on my far left, Chris Kerrigard, who is the political reporter for the Peoria Journal Star. To Chris's left is Jim Leach, the news director for WMAY. And to Jim's left is Bernie Schoenberg, the political writer for the SJR. Again, thank you for coming. Please have your devices on silent and hold your applause, and we will now begin. Uh, we drew lots before the debate with the candidates out in the hallway, or the whatever it is out there. And uh, we determined that uh, for our 90-second opening statements, the first to go will be Don Reins. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Angie, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Pure Journal Star and the WMY and uh, the Springfield Stan uh, Journal Register for inviting us to this. Um, yeah, I grew up I grew up outside of Dana. I went to Monoc Dana Rutland School. Um, I grew up in the area. I've stayed in the area. I've, I worked up in Stateville Prison for a year and a half and got back down to Pontiac, which is in Livingston County. I was there for four and a half years, but I lived in outside of Benson during most of those years. Um, I did tassel corn. So like I said, I grew up on a farm. Um, I went to school. I got two degrees from Illinois Central College which is in East Peoria. I worked at Vash Technology Services in East Peoria for Caterpillar Services as an external for a year and a half, so I understand those things. I uh, worked uh, State Farm Insurance for 24 years, and that's what I'm currently working right now. Um, I've done a lot in the district, and my children go to, go to public school in the district in Roland Benson. Two of them are graduated, one works in Metamore, and one works in Tulica, or both of those are in the district as well. So I understand the people in the district. My best friends are farmers. Um, I just, I felt I had to run for this. I wanted to see, I, I wanted to see somebody in there that is willing to do what they say. Somebody who will um, do their best for the people of this district. Thank you. Mike Flynn, opening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank the host for this. I'd also like to thank my wife, Holly, uh, and my children, uh, Declan, Binks, Grace, and somewhere over there, Riley. Um, you guys are why I'm running, because the first time in our country's history, we can't assume that you'll have the opportunities I had, and I was privileged to have. Um, you know, we're sitting here in Springfield in the middle of a budget crisis, a few days away from a government shutdown, possibly, and our elected representatives do nothing. They're simply waiting for the governor the Speaker and the Senate President to decide how we're going to spend state money. They're not part of it. They're not engaging us in the conversation. We don't even know what the options are. Last week in Washington, the President, the Speaker, and the President of the Senate decided to give the President sweeping powers to pass a trade bill that no one's read, that the public is specifically barred from reviewing. There's the theme here. Our legislators, in my life, I have never seen a wider gulf between the voters and the elected officials. They live separate lives. They don't even understand the challenges we face. When we occasionally have these kind of forums that they fight, we end up with very restricted rules. 
no videotaping, no live streaming, 90 second questions, no interaction between the candidates. That's a problem of the system. And this election and this campaign is about changing that. This is about giving you your voice back in this district. Thank you. Uh, Senator LaHood. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers for this debate. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm happy my wife, Kristen, is with us. Uh, we have uh, three sons, 13, 11, and 8, uh, that are back in Peoria tonight. Um, and uh, again, I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is an important race, particularly the circumstances that occurred for why we have a special election. And when we think about the future of this district and we think about the future of the country, electing someone that's not going to make the same mistakes that happened in the past, somebody that has a proven track record uh, of representing the conservative values here in Illinois. I'm proud that we're raising our family here in Illinois. Our kids are in school here in Illinois. I'm born and, bra born and raised in Illinois. This is important uh, to this district, uh, this seat is. And when I think about the people in this district, whether it's in Sangamon County or Adams County or Peoria County, people in this district work hard, play by the rules, strong faith in God. They care about their community, but they're not happy with their federal government. They're not happy with the direction of this country, particularly with the Obama administration. I've had a proven track record in the state Senate for four and a half years. Got a 100% voting record with the American Conservative Union on all the core issues, whether it's fiscal responsibility, taking on Pat Quinn's income tax, standing up for term limits in the state legislature, being the only senator to do that, fighting Common Core with the, as the chief sponsor of fighting Common Core, uh, fighting for ethics and transparency in government. I've had a record of doing that. When I think about the future of this country, we need somebody that has a proven track record and is willing to fight in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thanks for the opening statements. I'll uh, start with the first question now. I'll go to Mike Flynn for this. Uh, federal subsidies to pay for health insurance will continue to go to people in all states under the Affordable Care Act on, after the Supreme Court ruled on that issue last week. Given that action, preserving subsidies, what would you want done to change the health care system? Well, we need to reform the health care system. Obamacare went exactly the wrong way. There had already been movement in health care and health care reform to put the patient and the consumer in more, in more control of their health care. Uh, Obamacare moves the wrong direction. Um, we, we have got to center, recenter health care onto the patient provider relationship. And rather, rather than talk about who's paying for health care, we have to talk about what the health care is and expand access to that health care. Um, we have had, we've lived through about three or four years of these political theater of like voting to repeal Obamacare, but there's been no action on actually reforming the health care system. Um, we need to not just get rid of Obamacare that's on the books, because it's going to get worse in a few years. You will lose employer provided health care in just about three years. Um, it is already starting to distort the entire health care system. You, you have got to start over. From the, you do not just repeal Obamacare. You've got to go back and get back to where the individual, the individual consumer, is the one making the choices about their health care and how they spend their health care dollar. Senator Lahad. <clears throat> in the state Senate, I voted on two different occasions to oppose Obamacare in Illinois and the implementation. Uh, I stood up on the Senate floor and opposed that and would continue to do that in terms of the implementation of Obamacare. Um, I don't agree with the Supreme Court ruling last week, but I've also been very critical of Republicans. Republicans need to lead on this issue in terms of an alternative to health care. You never know that the Senate, uh, that, that Harry Reid isn't the Republican or isn't the Democrat leader. We need Republicans to lead in the Senate and the House, lay out a plan, lay out a clear vision on how we lead as Republicans with conservative principles. I think that starts with the doctor-patient relationship, marketplace ideas in the, in the health care uh, arena. Taking one-sixth of the private sector economy and turning it over to the federal government is not good public policy. The government doesn't run big things very well. And all the promises that were made, whether your premiums were going to go down, whether you're going to be able to keep your doctor, all of the things that were promised have not come true. And so we have to lead as Republicans in terms of laying out a clear vision on that. And I'm hopeful in a year and a half when we get a Republican president, we can pass a, a, a health care bill based on the economics of the marketplace and the doctor-patient relationship. Mr. Reince. You left me without anything left to say from those two. Um, yeah, it's, you can defund it. You can defund it in the, uh, in the uh, uh, House, but you should have a plan. You should have a plan to replace it. And what that plan is, I don't know. You know, you need, that needs worked out. 
and you should not have a mandated system in this federal government to the to the citizens. That should not be occurring. So that's that's the main thing there is to get rid of it because I don't feel it's constitutional. Yeah. Next question goes first to Senator LaHood. Another landmark Supreme Court ruling last week legalized same-sex marriage across all 50 states. There are a number of ways that Congress could potentially respond to that, up to and including a constitutional amendment that would declare marriage as one man and one woman. What, if any, response do you think Congress should take to that ruling? Senator LaHood. Well, I voted in the Senate uh, to oppose gay marriage in the state of Illinois. I believe the sanctity of marriage is between one man and one woman. I, I continue to have that position and will have that position if I'm fortunate enough to get elected to Congress. Um, but beyond that, uh, if you look at, in the state of Illinois, what um, same-sex unions have done and uh, same-sex marriage, you know, um, Catholic charities, Lutheran social services have been run out of business in this state. Uh, religious liberty is being, um, you know, harmed in the state of Illinois and by many of the liberals in Washington, D.C. If I was fortunate enough to get elected, I will continue to stand with the premise, marriage is between one man and one woman. I would vote that way and advocate for that. I'm also proud that I filed an amicus brief on this issue in the state of Illinois. So beyond voting no, I think you've got to take a stand on this issue uh, and, and lead on it. Would you pursue a constitutional amendment in, to that effect? I would. Mr. Reins? I would as well. Um, marriage is between a man and a woman. It is a religious ceremony. Um, to, for this Supreme Court ruling to have passed, how do, you, how do you defeat it once it goes there? You can try to pass an amendment, yes, but with nothing we need to do is we need to protect the current nonprofit organizations that are left out there that do not want to follow, due to the religious beliefs, you know, these rulings. You know, whether it be the churches or whether it be a, a bakery, you, we still need to protect those groups that want to follow their religious beliefs before so they're not punished. Mr. Flynn. Yeah, no, you had you had actually had two rulings last week that 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 showed that the court has become a political entity. You had a ruling this morning um, on Texas abortion clinic regulations that shows that the, the court is a political entity now. We cannot rely on the courts to save us from the work we need to do. The challenge now going forward will be on religious liberty. It was always the intent. It, it is the direction of where things are going. There will be, it was, if you will read the Solicitor General's report within the oral argument, there will be a movement probably to strip churches of tax exempt status. Um, you will see urging of clergy to have to perform same sex marriages. Congress has got to act on that. It has got to pass legislation that prevents the IRS from reviewing the tax exempt status of churches and other institutions that do not allow or recognize same sex marriage. What happened last week the Supreme Court is they said that the government will recognize same sex marriage. Fine, that's the government. We can always pursue a constitutional amendment and we should. But the question right now is will religions be compelled to recognize that? That is the fight for the next five years. You saw in Indiana, uh, earlier this year on re the religious liberty statute. It is a fight that is driven by the media, and it's a fight we're going to have to prepare for, and Congress is going to have to act on this. I'd like to stick with that issue for, uh, for one more question, beginning with Mr. Reince. Uh, with relation to, to some of what's been, been happening or been discussed down in Texas on whether or not public officials should have a right to conscience to if, refuse to issue same-sex marriage licenses. Well, that, that would be religious liberty. Um, just because they're a public official means they have to follow um, the Supreme Court on that issue if it breaks their, I mean, I could. If I, was a, if, I, if I was a public official and I was told I have to marry two people of the same sex, I would not do it due to my religious beliefs. So yeah, I mean, I don't think they should have to if, they, if, they, if they're, that's a religious belief because that, that's number one in, in my book is faith in God and following him. You follow him first. Mr. Flynn, your response? Yeah, again, as I said, I mean, government has decided they're going to recognize this. Um, that the question is, will religions be compelled to recognize this? Um, marriage is a sacred religious institution. Um, if government recognizes it, it means little to the rest of us as long as religion is not impacted on it. Um, 
a public official may be bound by the Supreme Court, but we've got to not get tied up in that question and look to the larger, broader question is, will people of faith, institutions of faith, be able to express their beliefs and not be compelled to recognize marriages that they find fundamentally against their beliefs? That is where we have to stand on this. We cannot, rather than sit here and find the hypotheticals of where somebody would have to do this, we have got to make the stand on the fact that religious people have to be able to express their views and believe it. It is a fundamental tenet of our founding as a country. Senator LaHood. <clears throat> I, I would just say religion is in our fabric um, for, the, country, for our, the United States, and it's part of who we are. And rig religious liberty has to be protected uh, in this country. And if you look at the assault from the liberals on religion, whether it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals saying that the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional because it has God in it, I mean, it's the ridiculousness of, of, of liberals on that court and many other liberals in Washington, D.C. that want to restrict religious liberty. And I guess um, I would also say that we've got to remember there's a Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. Letting states do, let, let states be the laboratory of democracy in terms of what they want to do out there, I think is also important. What Texas wants to do with gay marriage or what Colorado wants to do with medical marijuana or what California wants to do with health care, let them do that. There's democracies there. Let them be the laboratory of democracies. The federal government telling what you should do in states, again, that's not what the Constitution was originally set up for. And we have to, we have, to uh, have less federal control and less federal input and let the states decide many of these issues. So would you favor a uh, right to conscience exception? <laughs> yes. This goes to Mr. Flynn first. Uh, what laws, if any, concerning access to guns should be changed in light of incidents, including the recent shooting of nine people in a South Carolina church by someone whose racist views are apparent in his online posts? None. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. look, look, yeah. here, here. The media likes to create this thing, and they always say, like, well, look at this instance. You know, shouldn't we change something here based on this instance? You can't. I am not given a right to guns. The Constitution does not give me a right to guns. I have that right. It's a natural right. The entire Constitution is a check on what government can't do. It cannot infringe my natural right. Is, is there not a, a mental health, for example, uh, reason to keep the guns away from any do, people? Do we know anything about the mental health of this individual at all at this point? I'm not aware of anything yet. So how would you possibly write a statute? Just asking. <laughs> Senator Hood. We have some of the strictest gun laws in the books in our urban cities and have the highest crime. And so if you look where we have law after law after statute after statute on gun, on Second Amendment restrictions, you know, Connecticut's a good example. You know, it's very, very strict gun laws. We had a horrible uh, uh, event that occurred there. And you can go around the country and look at that. It's not more gun laws we need. I mean, it's, it's, it's the people that we have to look at. And, you know, so I, I don't believe there is, uh, there's a need for more gun laws on this. I think, uh, you know, the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment. You know, that we have to remember that language in there uh, is, is core to our Constitution and cannot be infringed, those Second Amendment rights. So I'm not in favor of uh, additional laws. I think. Uh, obviously, if, if, the, we need, if we want to look at all of these incidents that occurred and look at the background or what happened with that individual, that's, a, that's another thing to look at. But there are prohibitions in place if you're a convicted felon or you've been convicted of domestic battery or you have, um, you've been certified by a court with mental illness, you shouldn't be able to possess a weapon then. But, you know, those are the exceptions. Mr. Reins. Well, there, there are uh, some exceptions so people don't have guns, you know, mental health and such. Um, I don't think anything should be done because of this. I believe in the Second Amendment and I stand firm on it. Um, generally, it's the Democrats that push changing the Second Amendment. You know, if they use mental health, if they use some type of an excuse so we get less and less people using, you know, have the ability to own guns, maybe someday they'll say the Republicans are mental, mentally wrong. So none of, no Republicans can have guns. I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't do that. It's got to stay clear. I mean, there were nine people that died 
in that incident, and that's sad. And then you got to see the the parishioners of that church forgive the forgive that boy. So you got to see something nice go on as well. But yeah, there's there's other deaths that are occurring in this country that we do nothing about. That's abortion. How many people died a day in abortion? Yeah. So yeah, that's it. This is the Republican candidates debate in the 18th Congressional District on News Talk 970 WMAY, jointly sponsored with the State Journal Register. Our next question goes back to State Senator Darren LaHood. Ethanol accounts for $1.5 billion of economic activity in the district, but is still heavily subsidized by the federal government. To what extent should it or other agricultural products receive those subsidies? Senator? I think all subsidies need to be looked at at the federal level from a broad perspective and weeded out. Um, we got to remember that's federal taxpayer money uh, that's, that's supporting these subsidies. So whether that's peanuts or sugar or, or ethanol, we need to have a long-term approach for how we weed out all subsidies and have a plan to do that instead of taxpayer money propping up uh, these, these industries. And so. I'm supportive on a, on a broad perspective of weeding out subsidies, whether that's ethanol or, or whether that's any of the other federal subsidies that are out there. We have to figure out a way how to weed the federal government and, and get rid of the crutch that is really out there using taxpayer money to prop up these industries. Donald Reins. Yeah, I'm against subsidies in general. Um, I'm for free market. Um, what was the reason that ethanol was brought in? It was brought in for cleaner air, wasn't it? Was that one of the initial reasons? I mean, it's, it, it may help us be more efficient. It may be, have cleaner air here and keep us being oil dependent from other countries. So, and it, has, it may have some national security tied to it as well. So there are, there are reasons that maybe subsidize ethanol, maybe. And that's something to be discussed. It's not a, it's not a firm thing I'm on, you know, like, like I'm pro-life, period. That's it. But for subsidies, and even ethanol subsidies, which have some good reasoning across the board, let's talk about it. Let's see what we can reduce. We need to reduce subsidies and take them off the crutch, like Darren says. Every, all these plate, all these things, and yeah, I mean, let's look at it, and and, and we, we can see. And to Mike Flynn. Yeah, look, I mean, ethanol needs to be phased out. Um, but, but you can't just look at it just as ethanol. You have to look at the, all the government involvement in the agricultural sector. Um, it's not enough to say that, that ethanol as a subsidy should be phased out. Of course it should be phased out. But you've got to look at the entire package and what the regulations that farmers have to deal with, um, the increasing amount of regulations they have to deal with, um, the, the restrictions we have in commodities in that that you have to look at. We, we need to really bring the market into the agricultural business and look at it as a business. Farmers are businessmen. They can react like businessmen. We've got to get the government out of the involvement with farming and trying to dictate what's grown, when it's grown, how it's grown, the way you grow it, um, and how it's sold. So it's not just enough to say ethanol. I'm, I'm very encouraged that Darren wants to get rid of all subsidies. Um, I was very surprised that the Florida sugar people donated money to his campaign. I can't imagine why Florida sugar would donate to somebody in central Illinois. Uh, but, I, but I hope we finally have gotten to a point where we are going to roll back these subsidies and let the free market bloom. Farmers can compete in the world market, but you don't just strip out the ethanol. You've got to look and give them the tools that they can actually compete. Okay. Gentlemen, we've been kind of going around uh, some central themes here uh, with, with your answers so far, and I'd, I'd like to ask you straight out about the broad question, beginning with Mr. Reins. What does it mean to you to be a conservative? To be a conservative means you follow biblical rules. You follow, you have laws, you have order. You're not lawless. It, it means that you do right, not wrong. It means you don't borrow money. You don't spend more than you have. So there's a fiscal conservatism, and there's a social conservatism, and, it, and to me it means both. You need to be both. Um, you know, this government spends too much money. It has $18 trillion debt. We only have a $3 trillion, $3.5 trillion uh, budget, and a half a trillion of that is borrowed. So how long would it take to pay that off? So, and plus, it's also social conservatism. 
you know, the marriage between a man and a woman. Life, you know, life is important to me. Life is, you know, is essential. It's, it starts at conception until the end of your life. There is, you know, we should respect life. So, yeah, to me, it's, it's biblical. Conservatism is biblical in its fiscal and in its moral values. Mr. Flynn, 90 seconds to explain conservative philosophy. <laughs> we are all children of God, and we are all touched by the divine. And because of that, we are all unique, and we're all individuals. Conservatism is a humility in government that we do not know what's best for you. We would not try to define what's best for you. You go with your divine spark and pursue. Conservatism is freedom. Within responsibilities, we enter into a social contract through the Constitution to protect those rights we have so that others do not infringe on them. But at that point, government should largely go away and let us live. As conservatives, I've said it before, and it amazes me that we cannot, we are selling freedom. And if we can't sell freedom, we do indeed suck. Senator LaHood. <clears throat> Conservatism for me is standing up for the Constitution. What makes our country unique and what having it, the, the greatest country in the world here today after 240 years is the Constitution. And those founding principles that make our country the great place that it is and why we have the American dream. Those things I mentioned in the beginning, people that work hard, people that play by the rules, strong faith in God, but also having fiscal restraint, letting people uh, be free in this country, letting people uh, prosper and do well without government restraint. That less government, and I go back to the 10th Amendment again, less federal government involvement. Let pe people prosper, let people grow, let people uh, have ideas and do well. That's what makes this country the greatest country in the world based on that constitution. Less government, um, letting people be free and letting people um, enjoy constitution and the freedom that this country offers. And that's what, uh, why so many people around, so many countries around the world emulate America and want to have democracy because of that. But that's really the constitutional part of this and the conservative part of that is standing up for freedom. For better or worse, I'm going to be a little less lofty. And my next question to Mr. Flynn is high speed rail a worthwhile <laughs> federal expense, including the work that is underway now in Springfield? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Uh, study after study after study after study, it doesn't work. And if you subsidize something, you will have to bail it out. But I do have to go back to what something Darren just said, because it does bother me. The Constitution is not something that provides a blueprint for our government. The Constitution is not something that tells us how to run government. The Constitution is a divinely inspired document that says to the government, no, you can't do this. Don't do it. Constitution is not a road map. It's a protection. It's a protection the founders put in place. Senator LaHood. Um, on your specific question about high-speed rail, everything that's been shown out there is this is subsidization of, of rail. We have to figure out how we make this work in the marketplace. So whether that's ridership, paying the amount to pay for this, that, that's what we have to look at with every government program. And so the amount of money that's been spent on this program through the stimulus package and other thing, I, I don't think that's money well spent because it hasn't paid off. It may get a train going at a higher speed, and I wouldn't call it high speed. I'd call it faster trains. It's definitely not high speed rail. If you look at high speed rail around the world, this is not high speed rail. This is faster trains. So that's the first misnomer. The second thing is, how does this pay for itself? Ridership is not paying for it. And again, we're on the, the hook as taxpayers. And when you have $18 trillion in debt in this country, this is not something we should be supporting unless we had a budget surplus and this is a priority we wanted. Thank you, Mr. Reince. I'm not for high-speed rail, not for subsidization of it. Um, I am for rail so, since it does transport goods. But high-speed rail, no, not subsidization. 
covering a lot of ground here. We're moving uh, around to a variety of topics. I want to go to something that Mr. Reince touched on earlier, and that is the question of abortion. And Senator, we'll start with you in the context of your statement a moment ago that you just want to see less federal government. So how much should the federal government impose regulations or restrictions on a woman's right to seek an abortion? What regulations would you favor? Uh, the, the only exception I would favor is the, the death of the mother. Um, and uh, I believe strongly in, in life. Uh, having three children, well, my wife and I, and, and being there for the birth of our three children, um, life is something we need to protect in this country. And um, whether that's at the federal level or the state level, um, I, I think from conception till the natural death is something we need to protect in this country. As a person of faith, a strong practicing Catholic, and also uh, having a uh, number of friends that uh, have been adopted that are my age and thinking about the, uh, I have three friends that were adopted and I think about them, they were born in 1968, 1969. Of course, we had the decision in 1973. They're doing well now, prospering, have families, doing well. You know, I, I, I often think back if abortion would have been legal then and they're not around today. We have to protect life at every level in this country and if I'm fortunate enough to get elected, I look forward to doing that. Mr. Reince, what laws would you pursue to further restrict a woman's right to abortion? Well, um, as far back as I could <laughs> I, um, in, in the pregnancy, because life starts at conception. And you always have to weigh that child's life against the mother's. Um, if, the, if the child's dead, if the child is not going to become viable under any, any circumstance, then that's okay for, you know, I, I can see an abortion in that case, but you better be darn sure that doctor's right. Um, life of the mother, then you'd have to weigh and where that decision comes from for the life of the mother, I am, I, I just don't, I don't know what mother would, would not give up her life for her child, but that may be a decision between her and the doctor on that case, but that's, 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 that's that would be tough for me to buy into, yeah. Mr. Flynn. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to figure out what the adoption has to do with the definition of life. Um, life is life. It's not, it's, it, it's not a state's rights issue. It's not a federalism issue. It's not for the states that have the freedom to define when life begins. Life begins at conception. Now, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has ruled in a flawed decision that we cannot federally prohibit abortion. Today, the Supreme Court ruled that Texas cannot implement health care regulations on abortion clinics. Those were not restrictions on abortion. Those were not restrictions to access. Those were laws to say that abortion clinics should have the same facilities as a health care facility. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. All right? There are no exceptions except the health of the mother, to save the life of the mother. But life is life. Okay. Mr. Reince, uh, some have argued uh, for the last several years that uh, the U.S. is facing a crisis over crumbling highways, bridges, rail corridors, and other infrastructure. What would your proposal be to pay for road and transit improvements, and would you support a higher federal gas tax to do so? I, I would not support a higher federal ta gas tax to do so. Uh, I do understand that gas prices have gone up and that tax has stayed the same because it was, it, was it, it was a fixed amount rather than a percentage of the value. You know, it was, um, but um, I had that same question asked to me of a PBS cha channel a while back, and I gave them the answer. I work with what's in front of me. I make decisions on what, what I know. Where that money's going to come from, for the for the highway system, I don't know at this point, and you may not hear that out of a politician very often, that they do not know. But I would sure look into it, and I'd sure find a way to do it. But I sure would not wait raise taxes. We have a lot of unnecessary spending in this country, and we need to reduce our spending. Some of the funds, I mean, we um, the, it was like the the U the, the Air Force, the military, they asked for. I believe it was 25 F-35s, and they, the, gov, the, the government gave them eight more than they asked for. How about we just give them military what they asked for and save those eight, and that would have paid for a lot of roads. 
I mean, that's one way of diverting costs from unnecessary costs and diverting it to the right funds. Yeah. Mr. Flynn. No, absolutely not raise the gas tax. Um, it, it's funny, every time there's any kind of like crisis, the first thing a politician will do is say, we need to raise a tax. And the worst argument for raising a tax is, well, we haven't done it in a few number of years, so we should do it now. You know what else we haven't done in a few number of years is look at how we fund infrastructure. And we have an outdated mode of funding infrastructure. Um, we still send the highway money to Washington to then have them appropriate it back to us. That makes no sense anymore once the federal interstate highway system has been constructed. There's no reason to keep sending it to Washington and then hope we get it back. If anything, you should cut the federal gas tax and allow the states and localities to, to make their own decisions. We also have to repeal Davis-Bacon, which is just a giveaway to labor unions and drives up the cost of construction by 20, 30%. Finally, we have to stop diverting money out of the highway trust fund. Over one quarter of that money goes to mass transit, bike paths, nature walks. They might all be fine things, but you don't fund them through a federal gas tax. You have to fund them through the way they're actually used. If you just stop the diversion of money out of the Highway Trust Fund, you would have enough money right now to meet the needs that we currently have. That entire shortfall is because we, we move the money, and we move the money because we send it to Washington first. We need to relook at how we're doing these things. We can't just keep duct taping together programs we've had for like 30, 40 years and expect a different result. Senator LaHood. I, I don't uh, support raising the gas tax. And I start with the premise that the federal government and state government doesn't spend tax money very well. We haven't had a good track record of spending that in an effective, efficient, or accountable way. And so people are very, very dubious of their tax uh, gas tax money going into this federal fund uh, that's kind of a big black hole in Washington, D.C., and there's no accountability there. And, you know, when people in Springfield, Illinois, or Lincoln, Illinois, or wherever in this district pay into that gas tax fund, and then they see projects spent in a transit project in San Francisco or Atlanta or some other urban area, that's not what the Highway Trust Fund was set up. It was for roads and bridges. And so, you know, we got to get back to more local control. And again, I go back to less federal government, more local control in the states, the Tenth Amendment. Let locals collect the tax money and decide where that should be spent. People here in Sangamon County or Peoria County or Adams County, let them decide how their tax money should be spent, what projects they want. So if you're talking about whether you want your gas tax rate, let locals decide by a referendum and have your local people. We got bright, smart people in infrastructure here locally. Let them decide how that should be spent. And so the less we have the federal government involved, I think the better. I guess I go to Mr. Flynn every time, the way things are set, which is great. Mr. Flynn, um, who are you supporting for president in 2016 and why? I think the primary just got started. <laughs> yeah. Any favorites? I, 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 am, I am supporting the, 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 the strongest constitutional conservative that's running. And would you put forth any name to match that? No. <laughs> Senator LaHood. <clears throat> we need to elect someone that can beat Hillary Clinton. That, that's the bottom line. After the, the uh, seven and a half years, or you know, the, the six and a half years we've had with the Obama administration, we need change. We need to have that pendulum swing back. So we need to have the best conservative that can lead our party. Who's going to lay out the clearest vision for how we promote freedom in this country? how we grow the private sector, how we get up to three or four or five percent growth. Who's the person that's going to lead us there? We got a lot to choose from there and a lot of them have good attributes that they brought. But again, getting back to our conservative principles, less federal government, more local government. How do we promote freedom and the private sector to grow this country with conservative principles? And you have no favorite at this time? Um, I do not have any favorite. I would just tell you, I think Scott Walker, I like Ted Cruz, I like Ben Carson, I like Rand Paul. Thanks. Mr. Reins. Uh, you're trying to get us locked in, huh? Um, uh, you can do what you want. You're the candidate. <laughs> I, I can tell you two I wouldn't vote for. It would be Christie and Bush. And why? Because they're not conservative. I don't feel. I mean, I think that Bush isn't, and I feel Christie wouldn't do as he says. I don't. And as far as the others, Walker is a good choice. I think Cruz would be a good choice. There's a lady in their race that came through. It might be Ben Carson would, could be a good choice. 
So yeah, there's there, there's a there is a great candidate uh, conservative group out there right right now running, and so there, it's, there's some hope that we'll get a good one for our for our next president. It's the 18th Congressional District Republican debate on News Talk 970 WMAY, jointly sponsored with the State Journal Register. Our next question goes again to Senator LaHood. The current federal minimum wage is $7.25 per hour. Assuming candidates that you believe there should, in fact, be a minimum wage, at what level should it be set and over what period of time would you try to get it there? Senator? Um, I, I don't think that the federal government should be doing anything with the minimum wage. Um, and if states want to have a higher minimum wage, let them pass it. In the state Senate, I voted against a higher minimum wage here in Illinois. I, I don't think when you're $8 billion in debt and you're struggling here in the state where we continue to hemorrhage jobs, opportunities, and people out of Illinois, we should be raising the minimum wage. That's not good economic policy. If Chicago wants to have a $15 hour minimum wage, let them do it. Let them vote for it. If Los Angeles wants to do that, let the voters do that. They'll have to live with that. Again, I I'm not in favor at the federal level. I would oppose uh, any um, raising of the minimum wage. In fact, I, I would support lowering it or letting the states decide where they want to set minimum wage at. Mr. Reins? I feel, I feel the same way. The, the federal government shouldn't be in charge of that. Maybe they can make a suggestion, but nothing mandated. I think the federal government's uh, seven and a quarter right now. And I think Illinois is eight and a quarter. A lot of the states are above the federal uh, minimum wage right now. And there are certain rules to be in the min to get minimum wage. You know, whether it be, uh, you know, you have to work 30 hours or you have to be a certain, you have to be 18, not 17. There's, there's different rules for any, being able to even qualify for mi minimum wage. Um, but that should be done at the local level. It should be done in the free market. Let the free market run it. Um, I mean, waitresses, do they get minimum wage? You know, they get, they get less because they get, they get tips. They don't even get minimum wage. Um, so yeah, I, I would, I would, I'm, I'm not for federal government mandating anything with, with, uh, minimum wage at all. Mike Flynn, your thoughts on the federal minimum wage? Well, it should be repealed. Um, absolutely not raised. I, I have fought the minimum wage in the state level quite a lot and had some success with doing it. The, 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 the problem with the minimum wage um, is not just an economic one, because the economics are actually, it's pretty mild. Um, the problem is it wipes out those first jobs. It wipes <laughs> out that first rung of the job ladder. A minimum wage job is a first job. Two-thirds of minimum wage workers get a raise within the first year. When you artificially mandate a higher wage, what you're saying is we are going to move that entry-level rung that much higher. That's the problem when you have the government picking winners and losers everywhere. Whether it's the minimum wage or any kind of crony deal, when we have the government trying to decide who gets paid what, who charges what, who receives what, who gets what program or that program, it has devastating impacts, and that's what we have to start to try to get rid of. Mr. Rince, it's a magic wand snap of the finger time. Uh -oh. uh, if, if you could change any part of the U.S. tax code, what would it be? Uh, remove it. Uh, the, at least a part for income tax, personal income tax I'd remove. I, w I would like to see a flat tax, you know, um, where the flat tax is on consumables when you purchase them like, state, like a state sales tax. But uh, um, that's you know that's a, that's a long hope, right? Now that's the, what the 16th Amendment, I believe, was the one that passed the taxes in 1913. I'm not even sure which amendment that was. And yes, Don, it, it was, was the 16th, 16th Amendment. <laughs> so, but but I don't agree with uh, with us with that because I think it breaks the Fourth Amendment rules. Because if you're doing an income tax on somebody, you're getting in on their you're 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 looking at their private papers. You shouldn't get into somebody's house. Leave the people alone. And if we do a con we do a consumable flat tax, and we can do it in the same way that the Illinois does a flat tax. You know, it might be one percent for groceries, one percent for medical, and six percent for sales and such, for 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 other goods. But then you get out of the people's house. I look for a sales tax system that leaves the people alone, and it doesn't violate their rights. Mr. Flynn. Uh, the tax code is, is, is we, we all know the tax code is what's retarding economic growth and retards decision making. We also know the political system is gridlocked against any kind of reform. 
the vast majority of special interest activity in Washington and lobbying is to tweak the tax code. Um, you've got to change the system to be able to get reform. Several years ago, Hong Kong had a plan where they said to the taxpayer, you get to pick. You can use the existing code with all the credits, deductions, and exemptions that you say are important to you. You can keep using that. Or you can pay a straight flat tax. And you report your income, a personal exemption, pay the percentage. But you get to pick. We don't have to go through the political system trying to fight it out and decide what happens. Within two years, Hong Kong scrapped their existing code because everybody started to use the flat tax because it was just easier. You will not get tax reform until you break the special interest hold on the political system. When somebody like my opponent collects $200,000 from DC special interests, that is not going to get you further on tax reform because those special interests and lobbying firms thrive on manipulating the tax code. The, we've got to find a way to do it. I suggest Hong Kong because it's a way to break out of the gridlock, but we've got to find, we have to break out of the way we've been doing things these last 20 years. Senator Lloyd. I would just say um, the first bill I sponsored when I got to the State Senate was a bill to repeal the largest tax increase in Illinois' history, Pat Quinn's 67 percent tax increase. I was proud of that, and I was proud we got rid of it after four years. We need to get to a more simplified tax code at the federal level, a flat tax, figuring out how to simplify the tax code. If you talk to businesses, whether they're small, medium, or large, they are restricted by the tax code. It's kind of the boot on the neck of, of business in terms of growing and prospering in this country. And we have to figure out how we simplify that, how we make it easier to file your taxes. You know, small business is the lifeblood of our economy. And people, particularly in central and west central Illinois, when we look at businesses, uh, when we look at how we help them, reducing regulation is a big part of that, simplifying the tax code, you know, and, and, and also looking at things like Dodd-Frank that restrict our banks and a number of the other things. Big federal programs that affect small business in a very restrictive way. And, and in turn, that prohibits job growth. And, uh, and stifles our economy. Next question to Mr. Flynn. Special we, interest. We have a thing. We do we? have a thing. Um, <laughs> you just mentioned special interests, and uh, I know Senator LaHood's advertising talks about special interests. So I'd like each of you to name two groups you think are special interests and tell us how you would deal with them. The U.S. Chamber and the teachers union. Um, they both have taken a purported mission and distorted it. Uh, the teachers union supposedly is a mission of educating our children, but it's about preserving a system for adults. Um, it blocks education reform to create and preserve a system that benefits adults. The U.S. Chamber takes a very good history of promoting free enterprise and has been captured to where it now uses government to try to promote certain businesses. Um, both have fallen very far from their original mission uh, and both are about protecting themselves and their dues paying members over the systems they were originally designed to try to protect. Thank you. Senator LaHood. I would say uh, the trial lawyers are, are a special interest that I've dealt with here in Springfield. The biggest impediment to change uh, on terms of our uh, workers' compensation system, if you talk to any small business that is thinking about coming to the Midwest and they look at Illinois and look at our high workers' compensation system, they're going to go to Indiana or Iowa or Missouri. So who's the biggest uh, impediment to changing our workers' compensation system? The trial lawyers. And you look at the amount of money they spend on Democrats in Springfield, whether it's Mike Madigan or John Cullerton, they fill their coffers so that there's no change. That's a special interest that is also in Washington, D.C. That, that's what's wrong with our system. I mean, that's part of the problem here in Illinois, why we don't have economic growth and the private sector is not flourishing. I think the other one on the federal level is, is the defense industry. And you look at about the amount of money the defense industry makes and some of the wasted money there uh, at, at, the, at the Defense Department with some of these defense contractors, I think that needs to be looked at, too. Thank you. Mr. Reince. 
Uh, there's a lot of special interests. I don't even know which one to pick. Sierra, you know, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, Ask Me, you know, AFL-CIO. I mean, there's all kinds. Um, I have an issue with any entity besides a person giving money to a campaign. Um, I wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't, I would, if I had a magic wand, that wouldn't happen. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, this, we work for the people. Now there's, there's small businesses and there's corporations and they have interests as well, but they are, they are people in those corporations, people in those small businesses that can donate personally if they, if they care enough. So yeah, that's, you know, that's, I'd get rid of that. My, my campaign's running on my funds and very little of anybody else's. So, and, you know, and it's out there to see. Um, it's when we had tournament by last Thursday, I believe was the date or something, for the FEC three forms to see what our numbers were. And, you know, and I don't, you can go out there and look at mine, and I, I have very little given to me, and I kind of held off on people given to me because I felt it should be me. We've talked a lot tonight about various Supreme Court rulings and their impact. Another ruling handed down today throughout EPA regulations related to coal-fired power plants. What, if any, regulations should the federal government pursue uh, related to clean air, clean water, the effect of pollutants on the environment? Should we see uh, any additional regulations or, in fact, fewer or no regulations on this? Senator LaHood. Well, I would just say if you look at the Clean Water Act uh, and you look at the broad overreach of the federal government, in lots of different areas, that has to be reined in, in my, in, from my perspective. You know, if, if you look at the current uh, EPA rule that's been put out on the, that would restrict the waters of the U.S., you talk to anybody in agriculture, and what this would do in terms of putting further regulation on farmers and also on developers. This is a great example of the Obama administration overreaching with their executive power. This would affect any creek or stream or puddle on any farmer's land. From my perspective, you look at passing a law or a statute to solve a problem. This is not a problem. Nobody in the 18th district thinks this is a problem. And so what do you do about it? Well, you have to have a strong voice. You got to think about filing something in court to say it's unconstitutional, similar to what they did to Obama's immigration executive order, taking it to court and not being afraid to stand up to that. And then also looking at how you pass a law to rein in the federal government. That has to be a part of it. And, and so when you look at, we need to be looking at the legislature deciding these things. Remember, the House, it's the people's house. Something this important should be voted on, not some bureaucrat at EPA deciding it. Donald Reins? I totally agree that the, the EPA needs reined in. They shouldn't be able to make these decisions without uh, somebody from the House, somebody from Congress approving this. They need greater oversight. I live out in the country myself, and we have part of our front yard. You know, it's, I got several, a couple acres in the front yard there, and when it rains like it does here, I get that little river sitting in front, you know, and it goes through a culvert I have out there. Is the EPA going to come tell me what I can do with my land? That's the reason I live where I live, so that the EPA doesn't tell me, that no one tells me what I to do with what I want with my land. And I don't think they should with anybody. The, the, the rights of the citizens needs protected, period. And so the, the EPA needs reined in. Yeah. Mike Flynn. I'm afraid central, all of Central Illinois is a waterway this month. <laughs> and I, I fear what the EPA may do with that. Um, now, obviously, it's overreach. Um, the bureaucrats, they're focused on a process rather than an outcome. We, we don't need additional regulations or rules on clean air or clean water. To, to some degree, we won. <laughs> the problem is the bureaucrats are still there, and they keep coming up with new rules. But they're, they're focused on the process, not the outcome. Regulation should be focused on what, what we're trying to do, not how you go about doing it. Canada recently introduced regulatory budgets to where each agency, if they promulgate a new rule, the agency has to repeal an equal economic value regulation. So if an EPA wants to put out a reg that's going to cost $100 million, they have to repeal a rule currently on the books that costs $100 million. The importance of this is it forces the agency to prioritize. And it, make, it forces them to make decisions about rules they're going to pursue. 
Because right now, their whole interest and incentive is just, geez, just keep promulgating rules. We should, as, as, as congressmen, should also haul them here into the district to see the consequences of what they're trying to propose, make them sit in a room with the people who are going to have to live under those proposed rules, hear exactly what those people think about those rules and how it would alter their lives, and make them have a conversation. We, we do this all where we just let it happen in Washington. We've got to pull them here and make them Thank answer to what they want to do. Right. And this will be our final question for the evening before we go on to closing statements. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be with us. If you are fortunate enough to prevail during the July 7 primary election and clinch the nomination, will you commit right now to debate your Democratic opponent at least once before the September election? That starts with Mr. Reins. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's so, it'd be so much e easier debating a, a Democrat than a Republican conservative. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard to show the differences. I, I would enjoy that because, I mean, logic comes into play at that point, in my opinion. So, and, and, and facts do. And I, I would, I, yeah, how many, how many debates you want? Hmm. We did, you know, we, we had several ourselves here. And we believe the same things to the most, most extent, you know, greatly to the, you know, the same degree. So, and it's hard when you're in that situation, try to separate yourself and try to figure out what the differences are. But with a Democrat, yes. I, 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 it, I'd love that. Yeah. Mr. Flynn. Well, yes, I would. In, in fact, I'd even commit to a debate in this race before the July 7th election. Because we actually haven't had a debate, if you noticed. We, we've had times we could each talk. Um, it's all been very restricted uh, at some people's demand. Um, at least we're all get to appear together at this one. At least there's some streaming allowed at this one. Um, but we need to have a debate debate where we give and take and compare ideas back and forth because that's what the voters need to hear and that's what they deserve to hear. This entire campaign has been built by some parties wanting to keep it away from the voters and almost obscure the fact that there's a campaign going on. So yes, not only would I commit to a series of debates with the Democrat, because that's what we owe the voters, there's still eight days left. I would commit to an actual debate between these candidates before we have the primary. Senator LaHood. Yes, absolutely, and I think, um, you know, I look forward to debating conservative principles and how conservative principles lead this country forward uh, and taking that to the Democrats. As I mentioned earlier, I think in Washington, D.C. right now, you wouldn't know that the Republicans lead in the House or they have a majority in the Senate. They haven't led. It's almost as if they've punted to the presidential candidates and said, you lead our party. That's not leadership. Having a debate with Democrats on Republican conservative principles and how we lead this country, all Republicans should be doing that in Washington, D.C., and here locally. Uh, it is now time for closing statements, and again, by lot, uh, the, the same order as the openings. Uh, Donald Reitz, uh, Reitz goes first. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having this debate. Um, this is an important race. Whoever wins this seat here, you know, between the, in this primary, we need to support so we defeat the Democrat. Um, for me, I'm, I'm of the people. I'm one of the people in this district. I've worked many jobs in this district and understand the people here. And, that, and I'm open. And I, there's no facade here. You know, you, what you see is what you get. And if I go to Washington, I can fight. I mean, I didn't spend six years in maximum security prison and getting gang hits on me for, for no reason at all. You know, and I, and, I, and I put up with it. And I went right back in those galleries right when, after I got out of the prison hospital. <laughs> but that, that, very, that very minute, I mean, I didn't go, you know. But yeah, it, so it, yeah, I can fight if I want to. I just, I'm a Christian and I behave properly. So. Thank you. Mike Flynn. Washington's not listening to us. We saw that last week. They're ignoring us. And why would they not? My opponent, the anointed one here, ran to D.C. as soon as he could to fundraise. He's collected 200 grand from special interests and the House Republican leadership. That's not going to be an independent voice. 
they assume we'll just get in line. They assume that we'll just listen to what they say. They'll say, this is a trade bill, get in line. We're not going to tell you what's in it, but trust us. That's how we've done things for about 30, 40 years, since his family's been in Congress. Do we want to keep doing that? I have a proven record of actual accomplishments, getting legislation passed in states, joining with Andrew Breitbart and taking down ACORN, holding government officials accountable, forcing the Pentagon to reverse its rules as targeting Christian servicemen. And we also reformed the media and started changing how media works. Our fights are in the media these days. It's not enough to pat, introduce a bill that's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's not enough just to vote on a bill. You've got to be a leader. And you don't become a leader by going and collecting your pieces of silver from the leadership currently there. You become a leader by standing up for the values and standing up for the people here and by talking to them. Thank you. And closing, Senator LaHood. Thank you. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is an important race. And uh, I'm very proud of my record in the State Senate in standing up for conservative principles over the last four and a half years. I spent 10 years as a state and federal prosecutor. That was my passion. I've just been in uh, elected office here for four years. But I'm proud of what I've been able to accomplish and stand for. And it's not enough just to sit back in the State Senate and vote no. That's easy to do as Republicans. I've been proud to stand in the rotunda of the Capitol uh, with uh, only three other members to fight Pat Quinn's tax increase on tax day in 2011. I'm proud to be the only senator to file an amicus brief to make concealed carry the law of the land here in Illinois. I've been proud to be uh, one of the only senators to support term limits in the state senate when it wasn't fashionable four years ago. So it's easy to sit back and vote no, but I've also, beyond talk the talk, walk the walk. And I'm proud of my record in the State Senate, standing up for conservative principles and working on behalf of those principles. And in this race, I'm proud of the endorsements I've received. I'm the only one on this panel that's been endorsed by the National Rifle Association because of my record on the Second Amendment. The only person endorsed by the State Rifle Association. Only person endorsed by the National Right to Life. And the only person endorsed by ABATE. And when you look at the other endorsements, whether it's Governor uh, Bruce Rauner or it's Joe Walsh, uh, conservative in the state, and Governor Jim Edgar. Endorsements matter a little. The real endorsement is the voters. And we're going to work very, very hard, earn every vote in this race to be your conservative voice in Washington, DC. Thank you. And thank you to our three candidates for participating tonight. If you would join me in a round of applause for all of them. <laughs> If you joined us in progress, you can view the entirety of this debate on SJR.com or on WMAY.com. You also can see the Democratic primary debate there as well. Thank you again for being here, and don't forget to vote on July 7th.